Welcome to this special presentation of the CEC report. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm with CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robert. This special presentation of the CEC report is called Join the Fight Against Bail-In. What is bail-in? Well Craig, on the 3rd of December, the CEC published and a full page advertisement, which you've got a copy of there in the Australian newspaper, and it had hundreds and hundreds of names of people who endorsed the statement in that advertisement. And the headline is, Don't Seize Our Bank Accounts, Pass Glass-Steagall. I think that's a really important headline, Robbie, because whilst we're fighting against bail-in, the real subject matter for our country is that we have to have the equivalent Glass-Steagall legislation implemented in our legislature in our country. Yeah. Because, you know, it's one thing to defeat something, it's another thing to, to put the solution on the table. And what's stunning about this ad is that most people, Robbie, wouldn't have a clue that this was being proposed no. within our parliament, right? And we've taken the time, about three months, to call tens of thousands of people and say, look, this is what's going on. Now, these, the individuals that have signed onto this ad have gone through, looked at the, the evidence, read the material and said, we've got to stop this. So we haven't bothered, we haven't been able to intersect, you know, massive news coverage, TV coverage, journalistic, they're all asleep, right? They're still asleep. Well, and they're, they're a corporate controlled media and there's a, well, there's a bit of a vested interest there. That they've been asleep well. at the switch. We've done this without that support. Yep. Otherwise, we'd have 2,000, you know, 3,000, 4,000 names because people, you know, it's a bit like the old story about a guy gets hit, in a, you know, hit by a car and you know, breaks three legs or what at two legs <laughs> and go, then goes home and sees himself on the news and says, oh, well, now I can't oh, believe, can believe I was yeah, hit by yeah, a car, yeah. right? I mean, that's the sort of uh, problem that you're dealing with. I mean, people don't believe something is actually going on unless they see it on the established media. Well, so and so we've had to go to a lot of expense to, to, to purchase a full-page advertisement in The Australian. Um, that's, that's happened now. But that's not the culmination of, of the campaign. In, in a sense, that's side. just the that's mainly the opening salvo. And so, what we want to do today on this program is is go through in detail what this bail-in fight is all about, because we need every viewer who's watching to participate in this with us. And right? we're still getting people, even after the publication of the ad, we're still getting the denial factor. Oh, they will never do this, Robbie. We're getting members of parliament. We won't legislate for this. How do they know? I mean, the point is, this is a top-down policy put in by the Financial Stability Board, created by the G20, and run out of the Nazi Bank of International Settlements, right? Nazi, because it's a Nazi bank. The Bank of International Settlements was established as a Nazi bank. It financed the Nazis. It had Nazis on its bank board, right? Yeah. It should have been dismantled, as Roosevelt wanted to, but unfortunately he died and couldn't. So the point is that you have a policy being pushed top down by the financial oligarchy to steal Australian people's deposits. And well, and the, the deposits of everyone in the world, really. This is a global policy yeah. where um, we're, we're talking about the Australian legislation, but um, this is being run through the G20, as you said, right? And therefore, they expect all members of the G20 to have this passed in each country by next November. Julia Gillard said in 2008, no one could foresee the global financial crisis. They said the Titanic wouldn't sink, Robbie. The problem is that people want to believe yep. what they think from their senses is the truth. You look behind the scenes and you see the movers and shakers of this global policy. You can see it's coming to Australia. I mean, Australia is a lapdog for the British Empire, has been for 100 years. So this policy, we've actually, we actually did the way in 2010 in implementing a number of the policies, the re, what they call the key resolutions for the uh, key attributes of the resolution of banks of the Financial Stability Board. We implemented already a stack of these key attributes into Australian law. Was, uh, this is where, for example, already APRA has the power to go into a financial institution. They call them a, a, uh, authorised deposit taking institutions down here. ADI. ADIs. To go into an ADI, suspend the board of directors, suspend the shareholding, grab hold of the assets, create a separate institution called a bridge bank, break the bank up, right, and try and keep the system going. Like, get rid of that bit of a tumour on the side from that bank. Try and protect the system as a whole. And that APRA power 
is in the same suite of reforms from the G20 yeah. that bail-in is. Well, bail-in is what's called the third attribute, key right. attribute, Robert. Yeah, that's where it's actually nestled in there. And, of course, other countries have already imp implemented bail-in laws. So for example, the United States with the Dodd-Frank bill. You've got it in Switzerland. In Japan's upper house has brought it in. You've got it in France. You've got it uh, in some other countries around the world. So this is not a, a policy that's just uh, foreign. It's actually... And the other important thing is that Mark Carney, the head of the Bank of England, also the head of the Financial Stability Board, came out and said, I want, the, or we want these resolutions implemented by the time of the Brisbane November G20 meeting. So they're not, they're not so, uh, too subtle about it if you know what you're looking for. So we know the denials are false, but he, here's the thing. Let's, for the sake of the audience, let's go through the proof we have, right? Um, because why we're so absolutely certain on this and why they should be too, and then we can, I'd, I'd like to finish with the discussion about Glass-Steagall, which is the anti-bail-in policy, right? And it shows, it's understanding Glass-Steagall, it shows you how bad bail-in. But first, Craig, um, just to exp enlighten the audience, what is bail-in? All right, well, bail-in, Robbie, is the ability of banks to take their unsecured creditors, and when we say unsecured creditors, people should be alarmed and say, that's depositors. Yeah, unsecured credit. Which they don't, which, which, which no one really knew until this year when it was... No, you also started. got bondholders and you got other classes of debt holders and so forth that are liabilities <laughs> to the banks. But at the bottom uh, scale of things, it is the depositors. And how, how does bail-in work? Well, it means that they take those liabilities, those unsecured creditors, and forcibly convert them to shares. Now, they did a big stuff up in Cyprus. Because well, Cyprus is the place where they first did it. And that's, there was a big stuff up for the financial oligarchy. And there's a lot of furious oligarchs out there yeah. that, are, that are, you know, horrified that was done this way. The initial intention was to take 6% of all deposits across all banks in Cyprus and forcibly convert all those shares into, all those, uh, all deposits, that money into sh yeah. shares, deposits into shares. They couldn't get away with it because Angela Merkel freaked out and said, no, hang on, you can't do that because the first 100,000 euros is guaranteed. So what they did then is they created a good bank and a bad bank. Australia has legislation to do exactly the same thing. They shut down Lakey Bank. They transferred the insured deposits across to the Bank of Cyprus. Mm. They froze all the deposits and they've converted about 36% of the deposits in the Bank of Cyprus above, ab above the, uh, the, the, the 100,000 euro limit into shares. And the crazy thing is, Craig, because they've done all this forcibly, the these are shares that people are now told are oh, your shareholders in banks, but they're shareholders in banks. They no they no longer want to be customers in. Yeah. So, so uh, the, these banks are only staying afloat because they've frozen the liquidity. People can't pull their money out. If they did, these banks would collapse anyway. Well, and the other thing is that they get so, or you can have shares in this bank at this current price. Well, if it happened to Commonwealth Bank, which you know yeah. is what they're looking at here in terms of this question of bail-in powers, it's seventy-seven dollars a share right now. Right, so if you forcibly convert a whole heap of people into shares, what does that do to the share price? Mm. It goes through the floor. Now, and isn't it true, though, that this, um, the bail-in policy as a policy has been planned since 2009? It was because, in a sense, they jumped the gun in Cyprus out of panic and apply it, something they'd been carefully plan preparing for a long time. They applied it in Cyprus that the world stood up and goes, oh, is that what you mean by bail-in? <laughs> and that's where the alarms come from. So they 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 made a real strategic blunder in bailing in bailing in Cyprus. Yeah, and that that's uh, that was good for us. Yeah, because it said, "Whoa, oh, it woke us up to the fact that this actually pre-existed in the Dodd Frank bill, which we'd yeah. written, you know, three years earlier. We didn't know that until we we got woken up in a sense. Now, uh, I mean, the important thing is that we went then on to a, um, a research program to find out, well, what is actually the, the truth of that? Well, what, well, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about what we found from our research. Welcome back to a special presentation of the CEC report called Join the Fight to Stop Bail-In. Now, Craig, before the break, we were talking about the research that we started to do to look into what was being planned in regard to this bail-in policy of confiscating deposits in Australia. Um, I want you to go through the elements. Before I do, just to set the scene, it was a, about a week after the bail-in policy was imposed on Cyprus, 
which was very dramatic and the world was quite shocked that people could have their deposits confiscated. We got a tip off from a pretty well placed source among Australia's financial regulators who said to us, listen, you guys should know this is exactly what's being planned here. I hear the people talking about it every day and they're actually nervous about it because they know that when it becomes public, the population will be furious, right? So we started doing our own investigation and what did we find out? Well, just to, uh, by way of preview, Robbie, you know, in terms of creating this ad, I, mean, I personally talked to hundreds of councillors and what they come back to you is with things, things like, oh, but we talk to our financial advisor and they say it's never going to happen. I said, yes, it's going to happen. He said, well, how do you know it's going to happen? And I said, well, they've told us. Yeah. And then I say simply, look, read their own literature. The Financial Stability Board came out in their own report on the 15th of April this year and said, quote, that bail-in legislation is in train in Australia. That's what they said. And we published that in a copy of our New Citizen. We produced over 600,000 copies of this New Citizen, Robbie, and put that all around the country we, with the actual uh, evidence that this is what's being planned by the and, institution. And the Financial Stability Board report that, they were, that this was in was a report back to the G20 on the progress toward a global bail-in regime. And they highlighted we, us as one of six countries preparing legislation for it. Yeah, Robbie, and the Financial Stability Board is not just some little organisation off into the back blocks of the financial establishment. Australia's APRA, ASIC, uh, the, the Reserve Bank and the Treasury all have representatives that are in and out yeah. of the various divisions of the Financial Stability Board on a regular basis. I mean, Glenn Stevens, Reserve Bank, is part of the FSB. Uh, you know, members of APRA and so forth are all integrally involved. Now the in Financial Stability Board, Craig, it, it operates out of the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. It's a separate organisation, but they share the same building effectively. Yeah. Um, and what we, in looking at this picture, what we also uncovered is, is the, the relationship between our regulators and these bodies. These bodies are superior authorities to our regulators. And, and in fact, our whole regulatory structure is, the, the tone of it is set in Switzerland by this crowd, mm. right? So then you go, the, the other material we find took us back to 2010 and 2011 where this was all being discussed here in Australia among these bodies. Yeah, I mean in 2011 you had, uh, we discovered the actual report saying that the Treasury Department was actually paying for legal advice into how bailing would work. They, they paid, what was it, uh, according to $15,000 for a, for a from a study. the Solicitor General's Department. From the Solicitor General's Department to do that. Then in 2012, Robbie, they put out a report called Strengthening APRA's Crisis Management Powers, calling for, uh, calling for discussion about bail-in. In other words, this is the way they do it. They put out these consultative reports and then they ask for feedback, but then it gets involved in legislation as you go along. Even the private bankers, you know, AFMA, the Australian Financial Markets Association, came out and said the Financial Stability Board's key attribute lays out the principles for executing uh, a bail-in within resolution. We welcome the role of the bail-in tool for a resolution. This is a representative of the financial institutions that are involved, Robbie, in the $1.4 quadrillion dollar derivatives bubble. Of course they're going to want to have yeah. access to cut the liabilities. This is the bankers... Organisation and those bankers were saying that to the Treasury in mm. response to their paper. That was on only just this year. Really, the Emperor's powers. So they're saying, yeah, yeah, we're with you guys all the way on this. Yeah, and IMF, November two thousand and twelve, uh, it talks about this and in, uh, in the necessity for Australia to look at bail-in powers as part of managing its finances. So all this is in our uh, new citizen, Robbie. It's available on the uh, on the internet. Well, also, Craig, there's just just one more I want to highlight, um, and this is an important thing for the for Australian viewers to know that um, the IMF really early on in 2011 said that Australia's financial system as a whole is globally systemically important. What does that mean? Well, you've got the fact that, Robbie, uh, it's, it's, there's a huge amount of overseas borrowing by Australian banks. It's a cause of great consternation that Australia borrows so much money overseas. Now, a lot of that money is tied up in Australia's big four banks. So therefore, if there is anything that happens to Australia's banking system, it's going to affect the global financial system and vice versa. So we're intimately tied into the, um, 
the global financial system. You know, our big four are significantly uh, important domestic financial institutions. They're too big to fail. Yeah, IMF so, has said so if any one of our big four banks collapses in Australia, because it individually they're systemically important domestically, they'll bring down the domestic financial system. But collectively, they will have a huge impact on the global financial yeah. system. Well, you're talking about 500 plus billion dollars that's turned over every 180 days to a year, roughly. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, half a trillion dollars is going to bring down the system if, and in fact, that, that we default on that. And isn't therefore that why this Financial Stability Board exists? Because they say that we, the, the, our authority to dictate these kind of policies is because we are charged with ensuring global financial stability and therefore any country, any bank that might pose a systemic risk to the financial system or any country in Australia's case has to come under our authority and, and this is where it comes into the question of politicians in Australia because what, they don't re what they're not taking into account is they don't really have a say in this. They're going to be expected to pass legislation, that's it. Once they pass the bail-in legislation, they're going to have no say over how it gets applied. That's entirely in the hands of these bureaucrats run, run from Switzerland, right? What we've said very clearly, Robbie, is that we believe the legislation, as we've said here, is being written. It's there waiting for a crisis. You get into a crisis conditions, politicians are going to be looking for answers real quick because they're going to have to deal with crisis-type legislation and so forth. You can see this legislation being, here's the solution, boys, adopt it, without any questions whatsoever. And the point is that where they have adopted this bail-in legislation, there was no politically orientated activist organisation like the yep. CEC shining a very strong light on it. Now, we've done that through this ad. So it's political dynamite for anyone to touch this sort of yep. uh, idea of stealing people's uh, bank accounts. That'll give us a good chance to stop it. All right, let's take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the alternative, which is Glass-Steagall. Welcome back to this special presentation of the CEC report. Join the fight to stop bail-in. So, Craig, we've been talking about this bail-in plan, and we ran an ad in The Australian on the 3rd of December. I want to read the statement that hundreds and hundreds of people in Australia endorsed that was in that ad because then, then we can discuss that that statement is half and half, half about what Balin's about but also the solutions. So it reads, don't seize our bank accounts, pass Glass-Steagall. We, the undersigned, are unalterably opposed to the legislation now being drafted to enable the bail-in seizure of Australian bank deposits as happened in Cyprus in March of this year. The stated purpose of such legislation in Australia and internationally is to save the too big to fail mega banks whose unbridled speculation has caused the present financial crisis in the first place. But as in Cyprus, such legislation will plunge this country into mass misery and even worse. There is overwhelming evidence that legislation is being planned for Australia as in a 15 April report of the Financial Stability Board of the Swiss-based Bank for International Settlements, which is overseeing the global bail-in process. That report explicitly states on page 5 that such legislation is in train for Australia. The FSB and the IMF have classified Australia's big four banks as systemically important financial institutions which must be saved at all cost. The solution, instead of bail-in, the Australian Parliament must pass legislation modelled upon the US Glass-Steagall law which functioned so successfully from its passage in 1933 until its repeal in 1999, which separated commercial banking from investment banking. Without such a separation, banks are free to speculate with customers' deposits, which, for instance, is why Australian banks now hold some $23 trillion in highly risky derivatives. Numerous prominent individuals, even from the City of London and Wall Street, have spoken out to urge the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, and legislation to do so has been introduced into both the United States House of Representatives and Senate, as well as in numerous other countries. Urgent though it be, Glass-Steagall legislation is not sufficient by itself to ensure a recovery of Australia's actual physical economy. Therefore, we also demand the establishment of a national bank modelled upon that of King O'Malley's original Commonwealth Bank to finance the construction of great infrastructure projects as the cornerstone to rebuild Australia's once proud manufacturing industries and its family farms. We say no to speculation and the seizing of bank deposits. Yes to rebuilding Australia's physical economy 
with well-paying jobs for any Australian who wants one. Finally, we vow to help to drive from office any Australian Member of Parliament who signs his or her name to legislation for bail-in, but to likewise do all within our power to support any MP who sponsors or votes for an Australian Glass-Steagall bill and for a national bank. So, Craig, just briefly, those we've, we've identified two solutions there, Glass-Steagall and a national bank. Why is Glass-Steagall so necessary? You have to get rid of the cancer, this cancer of the financial system, Robbie, which has built up since the 1999 deregulation of the system. So bail-in is premised on the de cancer being the derivatives. Bail-in is premised on supporting that, keeping it alive. You're saying d d if we get rid of it, what? we solve the problem. One, pol one policy direction is kill the cancer, kill the derivatives, and the other policy is kill the people and keep the derivatives. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got a very clear choice here. Then we're saying get rid of the cancer. It's a political decision. That's all it is, Robbie. It's not a question of mechanisms or whatever. We've called for the legislation to be written. We know how the legislation has been written in the US, or should be written in the US. Uh, there's many ideas about that. But look, the point is that um, you have a, uh, a situation where um, without that legislation, Without separating out that cancer, the entire economy will disintegrate. It's not a matter of if and when, but it just will actually take place. And in Australia, we're talking about taking the big four banks, who represent 80% of our system, and who have all these derivatives on their books, or off their off balance sheet, but in their system, splitting them up so deposits Literally. are entirely separated yeah. from Yeah, so you have a, a strong commercial banking system with your mortgages and your loans and what banks actually are supposed to do. And they're highly regulated, just like the Commonwealth Bank did to the banks during World War Two, and then the Commonwealth Bank, you know, functioned as a marvelous example of a national bank. Go back to that. We have that idea already in place historically. Then merchant banking, the investment banks, if they want to gamble with people's money, then they can go their hardest, but they're not going to get bailed out. They're not going to use depositors' funds. Yeah. Then. You can't just leave the economy languishing where it is now. We've had an enormous contraction in the economy because most of it's been put into speculative activity. Uh, so what you do is you go with the idea of large infrastructure development projects, large manufacturing projects, support the car industry, redevelop the car industry into, for example, building magnetic levitation train carriages to, to supplement a national high-speed magnetic levitation train grid for the entire country. And the money... Now, that comes from where? The creation of credit, as was done during World War II, by the Commonwealth Bank because you had a specific intention at the end. You're funding an intention, Robbie. You're funding a growth in the economy, real growth. Which, that's the intention, and you do that by saying, well, at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a high-speed rail network worth enormous amounts to the economy. We're going to fund that through the creation of credit, not going to private bankers and getting debt, and we're going to use the expansion of the economy to get ourselves out of a, the huge mess that we're in now. All right, Craig, in the time we've got left, what can people do to participate? They need to get on our website, Robbie, contact us, you know, call the 1800 number, say, look, I want to get involved in this campaign, get copies of our new citizen. But they need to actually apprise themselves more fully exactly what the enemy, what this financial oligarchy is intending with the Australian economy. Should they get on to members of parliament? That too, you know, har harass them and make sure they know that Glass Deagle is a solution. All right, so that's the um, state of play right now with bail-in. We've exposed it in this ad in The Australian. Now we've got to make sure they don't get away with it. So join the campaign. But that's been this special edition of the CEC Report. Thanks for tuning in.